A comment I get pretty often is just asking about the instrument that I'm playing or the strings or the picks, the pickups, whatever. Uh, so I thought I'd film a video. I'm just gonna go through all the instruments that I own, the exciting ones anyway, and I'll talk a little bit about them, how I got them, and also grab a clip of a video that I have from previously. I also wanted to give a little bit of context because I've never really spoken about myself and what I do. To a lot of people, I probably just look like some guy on YouTube that has all this nice equipment. You know, if you total up all the time I spent making videos and divide it by the ad revenue I get from YouTube monthly, it would, I'm certain it would be less than minimum wage. Um, but it also gets me in front of new people. I get students, I teach on Skype. I also do a lot of remote recording work, so people find me, um, they'll have me record strings or guitar or something for their album. So I thought I'd just give a little bit of context up front um, so you know why I have all these instruments and I can talk about what I use them for, each of them. Um, I'm a musician out in Western Pennsylvania, so I play for a lot of the symphonies on this side of the state. Pittsburgh Symphony, which I still pinch myself over sometimes, the Erie Philharmonic, uh, Wheeling, West Virginia Symphony, which is in that little strip of land that's in between Ohio and Pennsylvania, north of the Mason-Dixon. Also some of the smaller orchestras on this side of the state, Johnstown, now tuna symphonies. I'm a violinist and a violist too, which was one of the things that helped get me up to the bigger orchestras. There's just all this experience I had um, since I was younger playing with the lower level symphonies. I'm not a great violinist. I'm not a great violist. Um, guitar is definitely my main thing, but I, I play all these other instruments as well. And because I'm a strong music reader, I just kind of fell into that gig in the last couple of years. I started doing cruise ships many years ago, which was also a reading gig. You got to be able to improvise and play a lot of different styles, but everything is standard notation. So the artist gets on the ship, uh, they hand you the chart, you read the chart down in a rehearsal that's usually shorter than the concert actually ends up being with talking and everything. Uh, you go have dinner, you play the show that night, they leave the ship the next day, something like that. And I did that for many years in addition to doing like musicals, operas, stuff in theater, like theater work as a house band musician, which is a similar type of gig as the cruise ship stuff was. I also teach at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. Um, I have a temporary gig right now teaching guitar at IUP out in rural Pennsylvania, which is closer to where I live. And um, I teach online through Skype, like I said. So let's start with my main instrument, the guitar that I've had the longest and I definitely have the most time on. This is my 2009 PRS McCarty, and it's a, it's a solid body chambered Les Paul style guitar that I got back in 2012 and it was my first like professional instrument. It's got a set of 5708 pickups on it, which I didn't realize and the guitar center I bought it from didn't realize. I had bought it used. It had a replacement Tone Pros bridge, which I finally just replaced. Um, the brake angle of the string over the saddle was not high enough, so it's sometimes had intonation problems. Uh, the previous owner had replaced it with a graphite nut, which was non-compensated, which I needed to replace with uh, the normal PRS nut to make it play in tune. Um, so yeah, the only thing out of the ordinary with this is that it's got the 5708 pickups and it sounds awesome. The neck pickup is one of my favorite tones. all my electric guitars first. So this is a 2017 Fender uh, Journeyman Custom Shop Strat, and I bought this in 2020 used. I tried this one along with like six or seven other Custom Shop Strats that were new from that store at the time, and I liked this one the best. Um, I'm not really one to buy a new instrument. You just save so much money if you find one used and you're patient. So I'd been looking for a Strat for a real long time. I had been playing in 1998. Uh, Mexican Strat that you might have seen on this channel. Um, it is reliced. These are not my marks. It's like a light relic, I guess, which I didn't really care about. It just sounded good. And I believe the pickups are Poblano pickups, which are like Texas hot style. It's just wired really normal. It's just three single coils, five-way switch, single volume, tone, tone, um, and then the, the bridge has no tone control to it. The only annoying thing with this, and I call it yeah, Fender calls it vintage spec. I call it stupid spec. 
the truss rod is in the bottom of the neck. So if you want to adjust the truss rod, you got to take the neck off or loosen it enough that you can bend the neck and reveal. That's about my only criticism with this. This guitar I bought in summer of 22 down in Nashville at Carter's Vintage. Uh, it was used as well. I'm just, when I look for guitars, I'm just patient. I wait until I find one that I really like. I had wanted a Gretsch style guitar, like a, a guitar with Filtertrons or Supertrons or something in it for a while. Just didn't really find something. Um, I almost bought a new Duo Jet around that time too. I'm, I'm glad I'm, I waited because about a month later I found this. This was on consignment. It was for sale, previously owned by the lead guitarist from Kings of Leon. So this is Matthew Followill's old TC6 that you can see him playing in arenas and stuff throughout 2017, 18, 19. Uh, he used it extensively on the Walls tour, and now it gets used with orchestras in Western Pennsylvania. This is the Strat that I bought back in high school from a pawn shop. It was 200. It had a broken headstock at the time. Headstock's still broken, but it's been glued back on. Um, I replaced the tuners with Godos. I have a replacement nut here and a replacement stainless steel bridge and saddles in an attempt to make it ring out a little bit better. I don't know if it helped all that much. The pickups here, we have a vintage style, um, like Stevie Ray Vaughan kind of sounding, Seymour Duncan. I forget the, the model name of it. I have a Seymour Duncan duck bucker and then the JB Jr. So two humbuckers in the middle and the, the bridge. The electronics are interesting. So my dad helped me with this years ago and it was a headache, I remember. But basically I've got a couple switches here. First switch is a phase invert for the middle pickup, which has a really distinct sound when I flip that. The other switch is just a coil tap for the bridge pickup. Then I have a master volume, a master tone, and this third knob down here is a blend circuit. So if you know about the Strat blend um, kind of thing, this is just a normal five-way switch, but if you're in the neck position, you can use this to blend in the bridge. If you're in the bridge, you can use it to blend in the neck. If you're on the two or the four position, you can actually blend in and have all three pickups running at the same time. Um, I've got some magnets here underneath the pick guard, which I used to throw a slide on. This was the guitar I used on cruise ships, like I said and a bunch of stickers on the back just because it's funny and I don't really care. This is a good transition for the acoustic guitars, I guess. This is basically an acoustic instrument with a magnetic pickup, so nothing is touching the top. It's a floating Kent Armstrong 12-pole PAF. Um, this guitar is a, a serious feedback machine. I have to make sure that the amp is on my left side. If it's firing into the body of the guitar, this thing is useless. I have like flip-flop foam material cutouts that go in the F-holes, which helps a little bit, but the amp has definitely got to be on the other side of me. I have Dodario Chrome 12 gauge flat wounds on it right now. I sometimes flip between the Chromes and the Tomastic Infeld Swing 13 gauge set. Um, the 13s I think last a little bit longer and sound sweeter, but they're much more expensive. I've just got Chromes on it right now. Um, and what's interesting about this guitar, this model's not made by Eastman anymore, this is an 810, so this is a 17 inch lower bout. I had to find a special case for it. It of course comes with a hard shell case from Eastman, but I use a uh, Reunion Blues gig bag when I travel with this thing, a uh, soft case. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it was also one of the very first Eastman guitars with a violin varnish, and it checks very easily. So. 
Yeah, especially thanks to Air Canada back in like winter 2018 or 19. I was coming back from Vancouver and they made me put it under the plane. They wouldn't let me get on the plane without it. So yeah, a lot of the damage on the finish of this is thanks to Air Canada, also known as United. The Eastman I bought back in summer of 2016. I had to drive all the way to New York City for it. I got it uh, from a shop in Summit, New Jersey, uh, called Guitars and Jazz, which was an interesting place because it was by appointment only, and I drove past it like three times before I called the guy, uh, and he said, come in the pharmacy. It's in his family's pharmacy. He met me at the door, walked me to the back corner, and I go in this like ultra humidified, very tall ceiling room that was just filled with arch tops the whole way up. And I played a ton of different arch tops before I decided on that Eastman. And that was one guitar that I did buy new. Um, next one is probably like maybe my second favorite guitar that I have. This is a Martin HD28. I played a ton. I use uh, Phosphor Bronze 13 gauge strings on it. I've got the Daddario XS, which is a like a coated long life string set. What I've got in here right now is a very non-invasive uh, K and K Pure Mini, which is three transducers underneath the bridge. It sounds okay as a pickup. I hardly ever play this thing amplified. If I'm in a very quiet situation, I'll use the cloud vocal uh, combination wireless mic, um, and yeah, it's got like a little bit of reverb and an EQ on it. I'll use that. Um, if I need to play this thing plugged in with the pickup, I can do that, and I'll use a Red Eye preamp, which sounds pretty good. I use a special pick for this guitar. I use a Blue Chip Tad 60. Okay, this is the acoustic that I play amplified most of the time if I'm on a festival stage. It's humid out, I take this instead of my Martin. Um, this is the one that gets used next to drum set and when I'm in a louder environment. It is an Eastman E20 OM. So Eastman used the Martin OM nomenclature um, for the models. It's actually more closely resembles a triple O sized guitar and someone might correct, this might be something you might correct me in the comments for, but I believe the difference is that they do share the same body style, a triple O and an OM, although the triple O is a little bit shorter scale length, the OM is a little bit longer. I think that's the only difference. I've got it with a, uh, a Fishman Rare Earth um, mic blend. So it's got a magnetic pickup that I use if it's super loud and feedback is an issue. Magnetic pickup resists the feedback very well. If I can get away with it, I try and blend as much of the mic in as I can because the mic sounds really, really good. If I'm just using the magnetic, I'll use an IR in my Helix, which helps it sound a little bit less like a magnetic pickup. Um, it, this is a pickup that you can install temporarily, but I've chosen to install it permanently. And uh, big thanks to Fishman because I had a, an issue with the mic. Something on the capsule was rattling and they replaced it out of warranty with no questions asked. So. Um, I'm a big fan of, of Fishman just for how they treat their customers. Yeah, I use uh, 12 gauge 80-20 um, strings on this one. Same thing, the Daddario XS set. The 12 gauge I think sounds a little bit better on a smaller bodied guitar. A little bit less tension, better for finger picking. I bought this from Dave's Guitar Shop in Wisconsin. I bought a used at the same time that I bought this next instrument. This is my Eastman MD404. It's an A-style mandolin, pretty affordable one. I had offered that guitar shop 1200 for both the mandolin and the guitar. That's what we agreed on, which was a really good deal. Um, the, the E20 that you just heard also, um, I think the pick guard was replaced by the previous owner. But this mandolin, I have the K&K &K pickup installed. Same thing as in my Martin, basically, except it's just two transducers underneath the bridge on the inside of the, uh, the top, fed to the output jack. The reason I use that in this one and in the Martin is that they don't affect the acoustic tone of the guitar. I use the Martin mostly for recording and um, when I play it out with a mic. So it has a really beautiful acoustic tone and I didn't want to uh, damage that with a pickup that's mounted to the top or that is underneath the saddle and interrupts the vibrations between the bridge and the top of the guitar. So yeah, this is completely stock other than I've just added uh, an armrest here just to make it a little bit more comfortable.
Okay, this one is not my instrument, but I'm borrowing it right now, and I thought I'd put it in the video. This is a 1912 Gibson A1 mandolin, which uh, is on loan from my, my mentor, the guy who was the previous guitarist for the Pittsburgh Symphony for like 50-something years. And I've got a concert coming up with like the main conductor that I just want to do a really good job on, so he's, he's loaning me this for the concert. Beautiful instrument. Here's what it sounds like. There's obviously no pickup in this thing. The only non-original thing on this is the bridge, which my teacher had replaced with a more modern uh, bridge here with uh, compensated you know, spacing and basically just for intonation, so it plays in tune much better. This is also a cool instrument, and um, I guess I should say I'm not a mandolin player, I'm not really a banjo player either, but when you have the role that I do in theaters and orchestras, you're expected to play like all fretted instruments. So I got this uh, 1932, it's a Bacon and Day tenor banjo. A special number two is the model. And um, it gets used for like traditional jazz styles. There's also surprisingly a lot of orchestra repertoire that uses the banjo stuff like um, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. I played that with Peter Dugan, the, the NPR talk show host earlier this year. Um, the Stills Symphony, I've played that a couple times, that has a banjo part. So, um, I can't remember the string gauge, this would be a useful thing to put in the description if I can figure it out, if I can remember. But, I, basically I went with a string gauge that lets me do a couple different tunings. So the traditional tenor banjo tuning is C, G, D, A, which it's not in tune right now, I haven't used it in a while. Um, so it's tuned in fifths, like a viola, C, G, D, A. However, I can also use plectrum tuning, which is like the high four strings of a guitar, D, G, B, E. Um, so sometimes you'll see tenor guitar music that's written for a guitar player, and they'll use plectrum tuning for that. Another common tuning with the banjo, uh, with the tenor banjo, is Irish tenor tuning, which is like an octave mandolin, G, D, A, E. Um, you can tune down to this, but the strings are very floppy by that point. So this is a string gauge I picked for the normal tenor banjo tuning, and so I can also tune up a little bit for the plectrum tuning. This is my Alvarez AC460C. It's my classical nylon string guitar. I use the Daddario Extra Heavy nylon string set on it. Uh, and obviously it's not a true classical. It's got a cutaway, the string spacing is a little bit more narrow, so you would call this a crossover instrument. Um, it also has an undersaddle piezo and a Fishman licensed uh, electronics here. So I don't really use the EQ too much. The volume's always on maximum. And then if I'm having feedback issues, sometimes I will use the mid notch. So you can pick a frequency between 600 and 1.2 kilohertz. Uh, once you find the frequency that's giving you issues, you would drop the volume on that mid control. So I've done that in the past, but usually my acoustic setup with this is the same thing. I plug into the Red Eye preamp and then I use the Helix for acoustic modeling. I have a custom IR that I've built with this um, as well as all my other acoustic guitars and sometimes I'll use EQ and compression in that too. It sounds pretty good and it was really cheap. My mom bought it in 2011 when I was just starting to learn classical. I used it last weekend with Il Devo, that pop opera group, and it was definitely the cheapest instrument on the stage. Um, you have to think some of these orchestra musicians are playing instruments that cost five and six figures and we're, we're really lucky with guitar that you can get a pro level instrument for like I would usually say like 800 and up these days if you're buying
Okay, this is my Alvarez. Um, it's an AP610, and it's my couch guitar. I think everyone should have a couch guitar, something you leave in the living room um, when you're not really thinking about playing guitar or you have an idea pop in your head or you're doing something, watching a movie, and want something to do with your hands. This is, um, yeah, for the money, I think Alvarez makes really great instruments, and my wife bought this for me from a guitar center years ago. I use the Thomas Dickenfeld Plectrum guitar string set, which lasts a really long time. It's also a very interesting set. It's very light gauge, and um, it's a round wound E, flat wound A, D, G, and then a plain B and E strings. This is not the strings that I have on here right now, but that is what I usually use on it. I have this cool Manouche guitar that I bought when I was in France about a month ago. Haven't even played it on the channel yet, but uh, it's a 1952 made by a luthier in Eastern France, Padineau. For basses, I've got two of them. This is a 2006 uh, Mexican Deluxe PJ. So I replaced the electronics with EMG Actives, which I, I really like on basses. And I have very light gauge, flat wound uh, Thomas Dick Enfeld strings on it. My other bass is an Eastwood, not an Eastman. It's an Eastwood semi-hollow. Uh, I forget the model number, but I'll put it on the screen if I can figure it out. And I just leave that one at one of the universities that I teach at. My fiddle is a, um, it's a Guarneri Del Jesu type copy. Um, when I say copy, it was built to those dimensions by a violin maker. Violins are typically come in a few different uh, types. There's like the Stradivarius design, there's a Guarneri design, there's a Guadagnini design, and then a couple others. But those are like the big three. And this is a Guarneri. So it has, uh, I believe, slightly thicker uh, sides and then I believe the, the top is like basically the same dimensions as a Stradivarius, but it just has a little bit of a deeper sound. Um, now I have a pickup on this, which is built into the bridge. So acoustically, it's not competitive with like classical instruments. It's a little bit limited dynamically when I'm playing acoustic. I think it still sounds good for recordings, which is what I use it for. Um, but when I'm playing out, I really need a decent pickup sound. So this is an LR Bags um, pickup that's built into the bridge. Same thing, I plug into the red-eye preamp and then use some modeling in my Helix with an IR, EQ, uh, a little bit of reverb and stuff like that. Fun fact about that violin, it has my name on the inside of it. It was actually a commission. Um, so on the inside of the neck heel, it's got my name. Uh, and that was built by Joe McDevitt in like 2015, 2016. Um, I had bought this from him in 2012. And when I say I, I mean this was also my parents bought me this. This was. Um, my viola that I went to school with as a viola major, and I still use it. In the symphonies that I play with, I'm a violist mostly. I play pop style violin, fiddle, and stuff, but when I play strings with orchestras, I'm a violist. Uh, so this is a very large viola. It's 16 inch scale length, which is normal scale length, but the lower bout is much bigger than you would normally see. Uh, and this was built by Joe's predecessor, um, James Fagley, who's since passed. And I believe this is like a 2008 era instrument, but I've had it since 2012. I won't waste your time too much with the ukuleles. I have a very cheap Kala tenor, um, which I haven't played in years. That was my first one. When I need to play amplified, um, this is my wife's Luna HTC. It's a Koa uh, ukulele. Very nice one, actually. This is what I'll use. Um, and then I also have this banjo ukulele, which same thing. This is my wife's. I bought it for her for Christmas a year or two ago. It is a Kala banjo uke. Okay, this one's really cool, but I wouldn't dare try and play it on the channel and offend someone. It's a, this is a Turkish style oud, and it was built in Damascus. 
sometime just before the Syrian civil war, the guy said. So like 2005, six, seven ish. Um, yeah, I was on tour in New York with my fusion group years ago and we went to, I think it's called world music Inn. I might have a picture from that day and they had one hanging on the wall for 400. So it was a good opportunity. And when I bought it, I realized, holy crap, this is a really difficult instrument to play. Um, the tuning I'm using, I think is called, is like a Persian type tuning. So it's E A B E A D and I'm sure it's way out of tune. Um, but it, basically, uh, an oud is from the lute family. The main thing that differs an oud from a, a lute is that the lute has frets that you can move around depending on the key. The oud has no frets at all. And lastly, I do have two electric violins. So this is the Ned Steinberger NXT. I've got one here without frets, five string, and one here identical five string with frets. They're tuned C, G, D, A, E. So it's like a violin, uh, G, D, A, E, plus the C string from a viola. Um, yeah, volume, tone control. It's a 14 inch scale length, so they feel like a violin. They just have that extra lower string. So that's my collection. It seems kind of crazy, I know, but I think if you talk to people in similar roles as mine, uh, like I know the guy from the Philadelphia Symphony. Um, I know a lot of guys that are doing Broadway shows in New York or they're doing touring shows, theater stuff. You just end up accumulating all this stuff because you're not just a guitarist. You need to be able to play a flat top acoustic. You need to be able to play an arch top jazz guitar. You need to be able to play ukulele, mandolin, banjo. Oh, do you need like a five string or do you need a four string tenor banjo? Uh, a nylon string. Everyone basically needs a nylon string also in that world. And of course you can't just have one solid body electric. That's my main thing. I'm mostly a solid body electric player. I love my flat gu top guitar, but yeah, you just end up with all these things, I guess. Um, yeah, you start out small. I used my PRS for the longest time. It was just me and that PRS and my acoustic was this, uh, this Alvarez I'd gotten at a pawn shop. It had a crack top. It was $75. Uh, and when I got that Martin, I gave the uh, Alvarez to a friend who still uses it. Um, the nylon string I've had for a long time. That's probably due for an upgrade sometime, but for now it sounds okay. The mandolin I used for years before I got the Eastman that I'm using now uh, was a Rogue that I got off of Amazon for $60. I bought it off of Amazon. And yeah, you just kind of upgrade the stuff as you have the money. So there's the instrument tour. If you have any questions, you can leave a comment down below like the video, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.